Why don't we start with very brief introductions. The panel, when we did the prep call, wanted to talk about October 7th. You know, that was an important priority that you, each of you wanted to talk about. But why don't we do a two-prong conversation, two-prong introduction, who you are, what you do, and how October 7th has affected your practice, wanting to tell stories through documentary. Uh, the four of us, all of, us, all of the panelists today, um, are part of a coalition called Film Workers for Palestine. Uh, and so uh, we wanted to share the statement that uh, we have publicly and that thousands of people have now joined their names to before we start. Um, so thank you. As filmmakers and cinema workers, we are told our words and images have power and that our work can help end injustice. For over 100 days, images of Israel's genocide in Gaza have flooded our screens, but this has not stopped the continuing atrocities. As human rights lawyer Blinini Garalech stated at the International Court of Justice, this is the first genocide in history where its victims are broadcasting their own destruction in real time in the desperate, so far vain hope that the world might do something. In just three and a half months, the Israeli military has injured at least 61,000 people in Gaza and killed more than 24,000 people, at least 9,600 of whom are children, making this one of the deadliest aggressions in the 21st century. Palestinians in Gaza currently have no way to flee the bombs that have destroyed 70% of their homes, have no access to water, food, fuel, and electricity. We are shocked by the deaths of countless journalists, poets, and other artists who have been targeted by airstrikes. We mourn this loss of life as we mourn the civilians killed on October 7th by Hamas and those killed by Israeli soldiers and settlers in the West Bank since then. We join a global solidarity movement to demand an immediate ceasefire in the region, to end a 16-year siege on Gaza and the release of all hostages and Palestinian prisoners. We echo the calls of Palestinians to address the root causes of this violence by ending the occupation and US military funding to Israel. We reject the double standard that presumes that only the allies of the US have a right to defend themselves. We expect our shared cultural spaces to promote safety for filmmakers, artists, and supporters who champion a free Palestine. And yet from Berlin to Los Angeles, our colleagues have been harassed, threatened, doxxed, disciplined, censored, and fired for voicing their opposition to a military campaign repeatedly deemed genocidal by human rights experts. We reject German cultural institutions ban on workers who have supported the Palestinian right to self-determination, just as we reject the efforts to criminalize pro-Palestinian speech that have reached the halls of the United States Congress. We reject biased reporting by mainstream media that dehumanizes Palestinians, purposefully neglects crucial historical contexts, and continues to vilify Arab and Muslim communities. We reject the cynical weaponization of charges and anti-Semitism that have been used to silence and condemn those calling for an end to genocidal violence and apartheid reality. In spite of this intimidation, we refuse silence because speaking is the least we can do. We recognize the calls made by the Palestine Film Institute to hold international film festivals accountable. And in this moment of urgency, we echo their call for filmmakers to use their platform during Q&As, talks, and panels to read statements highlighting the Palestinian struggle. In spaces where safety and solidarity are lacking, we will create and ensure it. And our capacity as filmmakers, actors, curators, film critics, and other workers essential to the international film industry we stand for an end to genocide, apartheid, and repression, and we stand for the liberation of all people. We are aware that one day our community will create and champion films documenting this horrific genocide, yet many stay silent now while we still have the chance to save lives. Our industry cannot continue with business as usual. We must do more than watch. We must act with conscience and continue to insist that Palestinian lives are equal to all others. We will not be complicit with anyone who acts otherwise. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so thank you. Um, so to start it off and coming back to your question, uh, you know, uh, my name is Razi Jaffrey. I'm a Detroit-based documentary filmmaker, uh, focus on human rights, immigration, democracy, um, elections. Um, uh, I'm working on refugee stories. Uh, in regards to October 7th, I actually don't want to center October 7th. Let's talk about 1917 when the death certificate was written that Palestinians are suffering from now because of the Balfour Declaration. Let's talk about 1948, the Nekba, 750,000 Palestinians are expelled from their indigenous homeland. 1967, when the occupation began that led to October 7th. And I think those are the moments that we need to understand and center when we're talking about the situation that happened on October 7th. That's where I'd like to begin. 
Hello, everyone. Hello. Yep. 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 Hello, everyone. My name is Colette Gunim, and I am a Mexican Palestinian American filmmaker working on a documentary currently that follows the journey of me returning to Mexico and Palestine to find the homes that my parents were forced to leave as children, and it's titled Traces of Home. And I currently also, I am the co-founder of Mezcla Media Collective, which works to elevate over 800 women and non-binary filmmakers of color in Chicago to really create a new thriving ecosystem in the local industry. So, thank you, thank you. And of course, as Razi said so beautifully, the idea that this, there is a much deeper context to what has happened within my own family, within our Palestinian relatives, and wanting to center that within our conversation today as well. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Fariha Zaman. Uh, I'm a Bangladeshi American filmmaker. Um, I work as a critic, and I sometimes uh, dip my toe back into working in the industry because I uh, really think a lot about um, community building within um, uh, the film space and how to support um, uh, other filmmakers <laughs> and film workers. Um, I because we shared that statement, maybe I'll use this space to just say, I, to echo the idea of context. I saw an interview with Kamala Harris recently where she cited context for the Palestinian uh, liberation movement as uh, starting from October 7th, that that is the site of context, is an attack that occurred in, on the Israeli people. Uh, and clearly that is um, just unbearably short-sighted. So I think bringing, uh, History into the discussion is part of the work that we should do. Right on. <laughs> I mean, there's not much more to add to that, right? I mean, so my name is Kamal Bilal. I'm a, a, a fiction and documentary filmmaker. And uh, previous to working in, in, in fiction, writing a feature, I've made uh, several shorts. Um, my, my films have always been sort of character-driven films that are centered in the Midwest just because I feel like it's not an, an image we see too much in cinema and it's where I'm at and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a very sort of like local, regional, I'm, like, I think those images are interesting, right? Because we don't see them enough. Um, and I don't, I mean, for me personally, I don't think anything has really changed with obviously October 7th. I think it's always been about how do we show truth and how do we you know, do that through, through filmmaking. Um, and I think what, what sort of impressed upon me is like, the role of social media in, in this that I think, my God, I'm just, I feel like, wow, the tides are, are turning because we're, we're seeing these accounts coming directly from uh, Palestinians and I'm seeing language and stuff. So I have a lot of hope in terms of like finally seeing people digging into the history that you guys are talking about that I, that, that I don't think I saw or heard of because I've been, I think we've all been you know, going to these protests, you know, since I was like a teenager, I remember writing poems and sending them into poetry contests about Palestinians as like a 14 year old, right? So this is like, I'm now 40, right? And so now I'm seeing people talk about this. Right, great. Well, with that set up and, and being able to moderate this conversation with this incredible group, um, well, we'll, well, let's talk a little about, about documentary itself and the storytelling, but before I wanted to, read a brief introduction. Documentaries provide the world the reference points, the emotional vocabulary to talk about who we are. These amazing Muslim artists and leaders are authoring a more human, more complete Muslim narrative and building community power in front of and behind the camera through the work. Let's recognize today is about hope and promise. I'd first like to th start by thanking each of you for what you already do. Being a Muslim filmmaker is in, in, an, in and of itself a powerful statement and an act of bravery now more than ever. So let's talk about the films that you do. So I, I wanted to start with Kamal. During COVID, you wrote this, bl this blog for Filmmaker, right? You were talking about having filmmaking taken away from you, right? And how, mm -hmm. how, how much that affected you and I think let me read this quote, and then if you could talk a little bit about your films, you know, and, and why documentary. I think it would really, you, you say, I'm just a regional filmmaker. You're somebody who tells these amazing stories about Muslim masculinity and people, but it happens to be in your neighborhood, you know, where you live, right? So, so you wrote, but cinema for me dives into the mysteries of the metaphysical 
humanity, the soul, and ask questions. So in the spirit of asking questions, what happens when making cinema stops? So in the, you wrote that. <laughs> and it's, Whoa. so. That was a, that was a COVID. Yeah, it was a COVID <laughs> correspondent. Fueled rage. But maybe in the context of where we are today, and I do want to state that today with the march, with this incredible announcement of what Doris Duke, today could literally be one of the most important mo moments for Muslim storytellers in this community. And let's like really honor and respect how this is one of many conversations we're all gonna have together. But let's just really celebrate that this is a start, right? But then I think, so. I, I can't possibly remember the exact state of mind that I was in when I wrote it, but I know it had probably something to do with my sort of, because at the time I think I was also doing an MFA and one of my mentors uh, was Lucretia Martel, right? Who was, she, her, she had a film that I, that I love called The Headless Woman. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember she had a, she had, she'd given a talk and I think something, it was the first time I actually heard a filmmaker speak about um, being kind of like coming out of the art and like what does it mean, like what does this art really mean, right? Like, where do, like if, if, if we're not being human first, then where does the art go, right? And so I think when all of that was sort of happening with COVID, I think that was me sort of wondering, where, where does this, where, where do we go from here? You know, and at, at that point it felt like, and I remember seeing like Martin Scorsese in a room talking about like, you know, he was just sort of obsessed about his next film. And I was kind of like, I felt kind of sad for him because I was like, wow, we don't like, maybe don't know what to do with ourselves because <laughs> we don't have this, this art form or something. <laughs> yeah. So, so now let's dig into one of your films, Baby Brother. This, uh, could you talk about, introduce the film that you made on your brother? And it's, it was fascinating how, how did it come about? Uh, so the, 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 the anecdote that I have, I mean, how it really came about was I saw him looking out of the window and uh, he, he saw a squirrel and he was crying. And I was like, oh, there's something, with, there's something going on here that I don't remember because he had moved out you know, and we all went away and then came back and he felt like a new person to me, right? So obviously he'd experienced a lot of stuff and he was very vulnerable, but that, it was just that moment. But specifically, it really kind of goes back to 2010 when I had just sort of bought a camera and um, I had done some, some work with a nonprofit actually in Bangladesh, right? So I had been sent there to do this, like make this little fundraising video. And while I was there, I met this little kid who was like just sort of an amazing, kid, right? He had something about him, some sort of energy that I wanted to make a film about him. And I remember going to the organization that sent me there and just sort of being like, hey, can, I don't really want money from you, but I just want to like access your members so that I can maybe find those that maybe want to support a project like this. And the big question was like, well, what is that going to do for us? Right? As this organization is very focused on mm -hmm. making hospitals and doing like glaucoma surgeries and that kind of stuff. And it was that moment that I think I realized the community that I was in didn't really understand like the importance, right, of like what is cultural capital, right? And that made me sort of really think about what is just sort of right here, right? And that's sort of just like going into my brain about like what's maybe more like in your mind you, you do that community, like you, you sort of like think that you have to go somewhere and, and do something, right? Like it was like that. Mm -hmm. So it was like me kind of like realizing, well, that, that doesn't make sense. And then I realized this idea of foreign. I was like, wow, what's more foreign than, than, than black men? In America, you know, we've been here for centuries and people don't really know us. Mm -hmm. And I just looked and I was like, wow, look at, I'm sitting here and I'm like, like, nobody knows what a black Midwestern Muslim family is like. So yeah. it was just very intentionally like, let's just make a film in that way. Totally. And then if you, so it was New York Times Op Doc and you can see it online. Premiered at Sundance. Premiered at Sundance. 2019? But, yeah. 18. 2018. But the way in which you just set it up is really powerful because in some ways, and I don't like, how do I describe it? It's almost like your brother, like it's almost like, jackass right like he you know he's trying to find himself and he makes mistakes but you talked about in your in the interviews about how you knew there was a tension of an expectation that a black man on camera on screen would be a certain way and then actually it becomes almost everything from a perspective that if you could talk about yeah and i mean that was a part of like the whole thing like i, I never really wanted him to address it it's just sort of obvious. And I think within documentary especially, it's like, it's just like a trope, 
You know what I mean? It's almost like, and even when I was on the festival circuit, it was almost like if I didn't talk about it, it was like, well, well nobody really know how to respond to the film in the way because it's a comedy and you don't see a lot of black comedies, especially in documentary. So it was like very intentional in terms of at least like, I'm just gonna make this film the way I would like want to make films, right? And With, like, to claim and to claim a narrative. Exactly. Knowing right. there's another reference point. Yeah, exactly. And not be what, we're used to kind of seeing, you know, this sort of whatever trauma or you know, identity or whatever he's sort of, he's just dealing with issues, you know, like they're all, that we all deal with, you know. Well, great, thanks for that. Um, so next, let's go to Fariha. Um, if, if folks don't know Fariha, a filmmaker, a writer, a cultural critic, a programmer, a funder, um, now, now you've talked about being Muslim has been so central in terms of how you, of what guides your work. You haven't always told films about Muslims, but it's, can you talk a little bit about how, be, how being Muslim affects how you navigate this world, right? No matter what you're a part of. Yeah, um, it's, you know, you don't know why you're doing something while you're doing it all the time. You kind of like look back and, and have a framework for, um, what you were drawn to, and I didn't grow up in the U I'm American, but I didn't grow up in the US. I was returning to this country for university, and, and then afterwards when I started making films, I think I was still like wrestling with what it meant to be American and what it meant to like be back in a context where I was visibly a minority after being around mostly South Asian people. Uh, so I've made a number of films that are about regional uh, working class white communities. And um, I think, again, there was a, a, a desire to sort of um, understand. And I think on a personal level, besides the art making, I, I, you know, sometimes I was the first Muslim or South Asian person that they ha had met. Um, I, I feel like I don't always have the energy to do that work. <laughs> and uh, I think it's, I think it's not politically effective to be uh, dismissive sure. of people's, um, what, what, what really motivates people's feeling of disenfranchisement. Uh, but, but you don't always have to be the person <laughs> to do that and engage with that. Totally, but, yeah, but, but, and then maybe getting, when you're gonna get to that point, yeah. but what, what were you, gravi what were the stories that you were gravitating towards and how did your personal background, like how, how did who you are inform the stories you were, because you did a whole slate of films about a certain community. I, I jokingly call myself a professionally nosy person. I, mean, I think it's like just that drive. Um, like again, I can talk now about like, here's the broader community socioeconomic dynamic that I'm interested in. But in the moment, I'm like, I, what, what is your life like? And my first film was um, about a, a community in Appalachia and what it's like to live without health care. And I think what what drew me to that was like, what's the, what's the, I think, I do think it, um, the, the, I think Islam teaches you to really value life uh, and, um, and the, the humanity in everybody. And I think that the way in which we discuss politics can sometimes be really devoid of that. So I think what ap appealed to me about that project was like, how do I ask people, what is your life like? Instead of, how do you wanna vote about healthcare? Like actually, what, what does it look like to live without care for decades? Um, and I think the other thing that we talked about a little bit is, um, I found over time that the landscape is a really big part of my filmmaking, mm -hmm. even though that's not, it doesn't have to be, it's not baked into the subject mm -hmm. matter. Right. And I, I do also think that at least, you know, the way that, um, that we, that I, I uh, uh, was taught in my home, I think that there is a stress in Islam on the beauty of nature and about how the, that like kaleidoscopic miracle <laughs> is one of the, uh, uh, it's an evidence of like some kind of force in the universe. Um, and I think that I also kept wanting to say like, okay, this is the person and this is their life. And then this is the whole ecosystem that they live in. If I can even gesture at that, um, that sort of kept creeping back in. Like what, what is the context in which people live? Yeah, so the film, if you haven't seen it, is re remote, it's remote area medical. And it's a pretty, I remember when I first saw it, it's a pretty astounding, like look at a community that on the one hand has been very stereotyped in mainstream media, but has also been used in the context of 
very conservative politics of those who've been left out of the, the American narrative, right? So I think um, it, it stands as a very powerful Muslim informed piece about America, right? So, Thank you. yeah. Um, Colette, why don't we go to you? So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about everybody's projects and then we'll wanna pivot. This is an ambitious conversation of how do we get to a place, a tangible place where more of these stories can be told. And then also like gut checking ourselves of like closing with in five years after this being one of many conversations, what, where, do we, where do we, where do they all believe we need to get to? Right? So, but Colette, the, it, you know, what I found very, it's always very moving and powerful to me to hear when filmmakers like carry forward a filmmaking tradition. Can you talk about what your dad did? Like, it's really, like, I think it's it really informs the kinds of work that you do, right? Totally, totally. I love this question. Also, thank you for your intentionality of these questions. So beautiful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so my father was a wedding videographer, and so I was always around cameras and editing when I was younger, and he taught me how to edit on the original Final Cut. Oh, that's <laughs> and so he would give me all his old cameras making videos, and so it was always in the background in my own journey. And yet I didn't even think about it becoming a career because it was just something that was for fun. And my father, he went to film school in Spain, and he came to the US to try to become a film director, but he couldn't do it. Oh, wow. He couldn't do it oh, because wow. he had the language barrier. He didn't have the access. And so, alhamdulillah, that I have been able to do what my father wanted to do and to fulfill his legacy um, by doing film. It is truly such a gift and such a blessing to be able to continue that and to allow him to be in my film, to be in the collaboration process to become a director, you know, alongside me. So it's been a beautiful experience at his age of 80 now. It's beautiful, but you, I'm curious what his response is of all films that you could make. You're, I mean, can you talk about the film? I mean, you know, it's a, it is a very honest, you know, with the intention of really moving family forward, but it is a difficult place for, that for all of you, it's a very brave film that you're making. Can you talk about what is the premise of your film and how has he been responding to being on the other side of the camera? Yeah, so in the beginning, my film was very focused on giving context around my dad's story of the Nakba and wanting to bring him back to Palestine for the first time after 70 years to find the original home that he was forced to leave mm. um, as a child. And for both of your parents, that's the And the, the journey, same thing right? for Mexico. My mom was a survivor of domestic violence. They crossed the border from Mexico and she also never returned since she was eight. So we go on these journeys as a family to find their original homes. And, and in the beginning, my dad was like, yes. No, he was not like, yes, sorry. He was like, no. <laughs> he was like, no, I'm not doing this. This is no way I'm going back to Palestine while it's still under occupation. And so it was a, a pulling of like, dad, we have to do this. It's not just you. It's for all of the Palestinians that cannot return. You have an American passport. We have to go. Your grandkids will request this, right? So <laughs> correct, correct, correct. And all of the Palestinian grandchildren need to see this. And so after a while, my dad decided to finally do it. And so we kept it at that. And he's like, yes, I can talk about Palestine. The next step was then talking about family trauma. <laughs> and I'm sure for those who are children of immigrants, we don't talk about family trauma. <laughs> we don't talk about family trauma on film in public. You know, that's extreme. What's it's your extreme. parents on screen? Yeah. And putting my parents on screen to tell all the family secrets, all of the, what did we say, in the last panel, you know, all of the... <laughs> What's the word? Mm, I forgot it. You know, the warts. Yes, warts. <laughs> so it, it has been extremely difficult to allow them to start to open up. And it has become therapy. This documentary has become therapy for my family to go through with the camera being used as a tool and a shield to start unpacking why there were so many emotional walls in my home and why there was this disconnect. Why I couldn't feel like I could be myself at home. Um, and it's because of the intergenerational trauma that was passed down from forced migration. So yeah, it's been a journey to get them to, to speak, but 
We're doing it. We're at Rough Cut. <laughs> so it's happening. <laughs> yes. yes. Thank you. Well, and it'll be a real gift, obviously, for audiences and families mm -hmm. to, 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 to participate in, you know, to, to bear witness to. Right? So, yeah. Well, they, thank you. So, Rosie, why don't we talk about you? You um, came to filmmaking, you know, after having a different career, right? And, and it's been interesting. There have been threads in your work of, uh, I think you talked about always your work. What's, what, what seems to overlap is the conversation between institutions and Muslims, right? But can you talk a little bit about your journey to become a filmmaker, right? Yeah, I um, I grew up in an immigrant South Asian family. I was born in India, and like a good South Asian son, I studied engineering, and <laughs> <laughs> I was miserable for 10 years. Um, because, look, I think from a very young age, I um, was a very liberal arts-minded person, um, you know, uh, you know, very creative and, uh, as I got closer to college, I like decided to make a practical choice and study en engineering. And um, you know, after a ten-year career, uh, I finally decided to leave. I mean, I'm leaving a lot out in the for the sake of <laughs> brevity. Um, and part of my motivation in leaving and pursuing storytelling and art and uh, self-expression um, is telling stories from our perspective. I think for so long. Um, in our history, in, in the Muslim community's history in the United States, others have told our story, and that has left us hurt, uh, impaired. <laughs> um, we've been so, um, it's brought so much damage to our community, and I think, you know, there was a motivation to sort of take the reins. I wanted to be an author in the discourse on who Muslims are and our role in society. And I was very interested in institutions like the democratic institution, government, um, so my first film um, explores life and democracy in America's first Muslim majority city. The film was supported by ISF, uh, CAM, um, those early grants really, um, thank you, yeah. Um, those uh, early grants and a shoestring budget, somehow miraculously the film got into the South by Southwest Film Festival, it eventually was on public television. Well, deservedly it got in. Thank you, yeah, yeah thank you so much, yeah. Um, but I think so much of my work in addition to expressing Muslim life is decolonizing work, which is work that I'm doing on myself as well. And I think to a large degree, we're all doing that. And all the Muslim filmmakers are doing that. And we're not trailblazers. We're not leaders in this field. I mean, we're out there. We're putting our work out there. And I think, um, you know, we're very talented. There's a lot of talent in the Muslim community. And so much of that um, is driven you know, by us standing on the shoulders of giants. And I think bringing it back to the Palestinian context, um, the work of Edward Said, the Hassan Kanafani, um, the work of Mahmoud Darwish, um, you don't have post-colonial studies if you don't have Edward Said's work, Orientalism. And so we're standing on the shoulders of these giants and our work is built on that. And so my work is decolonizing myself, but it's also decolonizing the, the stories that we tell about ourselves and who gets to tell those stories. And I applaud ISF, I applaud CAM, uh, the Black Star Film Festival, um, all of these organizations which are centering black and brown BIPOC stories and storytellers to be able to do that work because we can't let others tell our stories. And that's the place that I'm in and that's the type of work that I'm doing and that's the type of stories that I, that I wanna tell in my work. Yeah, um, thank you. It is true that the community is standing on shoulders of giants, but I think it is just from a from within community. It is astounding as context the 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 dozens of Muslim documentary filmmakers are all immensely respected, you know, and that's in spite of an understanding that you know there there isn't a lot of infrastructure yet in the media arts perspective. There isn't a lot of resources yet. What I've been learning, what we've been learning through our conversations is that what is what exact what exists for the scholarship fund and for impact is so much of the of the amazing work that they do is in fact funded by the Muslim community. And that has to shift, right? I think for CAM, there's a commitment to make sure 
that there's a that three years from now that there's a permanence to our community, our field, fully invests and supports and, and makes this, you know, this this you know incredible community that has been making all of our work better. You know, I was going to center some of the conversation around jihad, rehab, and Sundance, but now I'm feeling like let's just keep pushing forward about what's possible. And it's interesting how this all evolves of like, do we need to repair from that moment or in fact, just just move forward, right? Um, so why don't we talk a little bit about like, um, what do we need, right? So, Razi, like, like what, what is it? And I, and I do wanna honor that there's an awful lot of power like with what you all do. And, and I wanna give a little anecdotal note of like we, we, we work in CAM with a lot of very respected filmmakers who've done well in Hollywood and, and it, it was painful for us to hear and I don't think it happens in the Muslim community of one of the best roles for succeeding as an Asian American filmmaker in Hollywood, don't trust the Asian in the room. And what we've been, you know, and I think in the context of what you hear today, it's a deep commitment to like, this is, that's not a world we wanna be a part of. And I think, but the other question is how do we support you all and, and the dozens others so that, so this work that's being done to sustain and that you're sustainable. So, so with that. Yeah, I mean, just sort of building on what I was saying earlier, the, the talent in the Muslim filmmaking community is so immense and we're just starting to see that emerge. So we don't need other people telling our stories. We have to stop this. And uh, you know, the more that that continues to happen, the more frustration and the more misinformation is gonna continue to spread about our, infra about our community over and over and over again. And we're in a hole trying to dig out of that. And it creates more work for us. If we can naturally allow and support our filmmakers, our storytellers to tell our stories, that is decolonizing work. And we have to bring decolonization into our framework, into how we do our work and how we support filmmakers. And I think the biggest thing we can do, and, and really, like I think Doris Duke really deserves a lot of praise for this influx of support. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, the support for organizations like CAM and like ISF. Um, uh, you know, you guys were one of the first grant I ever got for a documentary, the Hamtramck USA, was from CAM. You know, and so I owe a lot in my career, and the second one was ISF. <laughs> um, you know, I, I owe so much in my career to these organizations. So I think we have to support, uh, we have to support these organizations. We have to continue to support them so they can create platforms so they can support Muslim filmmakers and black and brown filmmakers so they can continue to do this work. Uh, I think that's probably the most important thing right now because the talent is there. We don't need other, others telling our story. We can do it ourselves and we'll do a much better job. And you know, we're, there's nobody else better to do that. So I think that's a good place to begin. Great. What do we need to sustain ourselves? This is it. Yeah. This, this is a dream, truly. I'm like, is this even real right now that we get to be in a place where we can just be so ourselves? Like, this is, this, is, this is truly revolutionary work that you are all leading. So thank you so much for creating spaces for us to just show up as ourselves, truly. Um, I went to a film festival last year and I just felt so out of place. I, f I went to my room crying because I was like, what am I doing here? I feel so fake. I feel like I have my mask on. I was like, I just don't want to even be here. I have felt I'm in a family right now. Like I'm in summer camp. I don't even know how to explain it. Like. <laughs> Oh my God, oh my God. Um, the Islamic Scholarship Fund, what you are all doing to create, you know, what, over 120 filmmakers over the past 15 years, creating that legacy for us to be able to do the work and to be able to do our sole purpose of doing our art is transformational. And of course, Sue, I just met you and I love you. <laughs> like you're amazing, amazing. MPAC, everything has just been, and of course, Doris Duke. Literally the only reason I'm able to do this work and this healing work of my family is because Doris Duke funded it. Like it has changed the trajectory of my family, the work that you are all doing. Um, so 
by us sustaining ourselves in community as the backbone for one another, it is, it is the transformational work. The people that I'm in the cohort with, the seven people I am with right now, like, oh my God, I could cry. I feel like, wow, to be with people that are so aligned in both film, in faith, in healing our, ourselves, in deep consciousness, like you are such a gift. And if we had like communities of this, just like, you know, just thriving, wow, what a world. What a world to live in of unconditional love. Um, that's it, this is it, this is it. This, this is the sustainability. Um, and artist grants. <laughs> Career grants, not just projects. And funding. And funding. Money. I am complete. Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, among many things that we need, um, I think we need to keep affirming for each other that we can tell what stories we want however we want. I think we've touched on uh, the idea that, of course, if you're from certain regions or certain backgrounds, the existing sort of dominant culture wants a particular narrative from you, which is uh, so oppressive. Uh, but on top of that, like you're not allowed to make an experimental film. You're not allowed to make uh, this context, that length, whatever. And I, uh, of course, like that uh, strength needs to come from within. It needs to be institutionally supported. But we also need to tell each other, like yeah. you can make whatever the fuck movie you want to make. Like yeah. you should get to make whatever movie you want to make yeah. and not have it be defined by your background. And take a little more time. We're actually going pretty fast. Um, I, I tend well, to. Uh, so yeah. Well, I and and, if, and when we were doing the prep conversation for here, you said, "I want to be able to have. I don't want to have to keep referencing success through the language of white filmmakers." Right? Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? <laughs> I mean, that's it. <laughs> I, and, and nor should I have to. Like, I think we, we just, you know, um, uh, probably everybody in this room understands what it's like to like constantly have to translate through a completely different system of value that devalues your own. We should be able to come to the table with what we're offering that's unique, that's actually uh, what makes your film um, worthwhile and valuable is what doesn't exist already and what needs to be explained through your voice and your work. Um, and I, I, I feel that I, cl I clearly have some anger and frustration about about that. And I wanted to add that but, like- But I, you've been doing something about that, right? So maybe if you could plug plug that, right? <laughs> um, I, okay, so, you know, it, yes, some of our community building and activism is in response to seeing things that we are frustrated by and things that we want to change. And then you hit a wall where you're like, I can't, now I just have these other films' names in my mouth all day. I want, I don't want to talk about that anymore. I want to talk about us. Um, and uh, when I was in that place, I started a screening series um, that's at the yeah. Museum of the Moving Image in New York uh, called Infinite Beauty. Uh, and it's um, uh, Muslim Minasa representation on screen. Um, and it's in part to show, it's, it sounds so simple, but like, we are not a monolith. This, when you refer to Muslim culture, how many countries and regions does that refer to, you know? And I wanted to show the breadth of that. I wanted, we show experimental work, we have romantic comedies. Like I, I also want to show that, the, that, that we can make work in, in all these different veins. I don't want to be defined by um, the trauma story uh, and the I'm trying to explain something to the West about being a good Muslim story. Right. Um, and I think, you know, one thing that I told you that I, honestly think about all the time even though it's um uh i don't know if it's silly or not but so you know some of the some of the films engage with muslim identity and some don't because sometimes muslim people just hang out and i just wanted to punctuate this point with an with an anecdote of something that happened to me recently uh, a filmmaker friend of mine who I really, really respect and admire, he's an Israeli uh, filmmaker, um, told me about a colleague of his who was interested in making a documentary about what's been going on on co college campuses these days. And this person, my friend didn't know this person that well, but um, she seemed sincere. So, you know, he, he was like, she wants to talk to a Muslim or Arab filmmaker. Maybe you can give her some advice. Um, and so I'm like, sure. You know, I'll, I'll take this phone call. So this white Jewish filmmaker calls me up and we have a very 
um, productive conversation. She tells me about her idea, and she asks me if I'm interested in co-directing or working on the project with her. Um, you know, I, I, I told her that I'm not sure if I have the time or I'm the right person for it. Um, I think right now that Palestinian voices need to be centered. There's a slew of Palestinian filmmakers that could be really great for this. And I gave her some names and she at one point cut me off and she said, well, hold on a second. I, I'm not sure if I want a Palestinian telling the story because they're too close to this topic. So this is the reality that we're dealing with right now. That the colonization mindset is so deep and we have to, we have so much to work against. And this is the point that we're talking about here, that we have to be the ones that tell our stories because the colonized mindset says that we are not able to tell our stories in a proper way. And what is that? That's Orientalism, the master discourse on the East and the West as defined by the West. And that's what happened in that moment in that phone call. And I, I mean, I'm just losing patience with these kind of conversations and I just gave it to her. And I've had in the last three years, uh, this was the third conversation like this that I've had. And I tell these people, you should not be making this film. You should step aside. I can give you the names of 10 filmmakers who are brilliant, who would run circles around anybody and make this film and tell the story in a much more empathetic and nuanced way. And people don't want to hear that. And I think a lot of white people, we have to be honest, are afraid of losing their position in society. And this replacement theory concept isn't just with conservatives in Kentucky, white liberals are terrified of being replaced. And this is one of the biggest, I, I really don't want to get into a conversation about jihad rehab, but I think later on, <laughs> I'm so sorry, like later on, yeah, six months like later, the, the six, you know, six, seven, eight months later, um, the discourse around jihad rehab was exactly around this, that liberal filmmakers got involved in the discourse protecting and standing up for the filmmaker of Jihad Rehab. And this is a, a blatant example of, yeah. of a fear of being replaced. Well, and it was also just to, I, I assume a lot of people here have tracked it, it was also, how dare you, we were doing a film to help you. So patronizing, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the position and attitude of most white European filmmakers who make movies about our communities. Now, there are some people who do a good job, you know? It's, the, it's not an all or nothing situation. There are principles and guidelines and ways to do this where it can be effective and it can be done well. I just think it's not done commonly. Yeah, yeah. and wh why don't we go to Kamau after, but actually what's also interesting about the four of you, if I'm not mistaken, each of you have co-directed, like you've worked, collaborated on multiple films, so there's something, there's a narrative that's put out there versus a real narrative of how stories get told and what you all are committed to as individual artists, right? What, what, what was the, the question we were engaged? The question was around, like what, you know, around, and actually <laughs> you told me, I wanna leave this conversation with tangible results. Yeah, that's, I mean, but yeah, But so like tangibly, get building on this conversation, Yeah. what, what are some yeah some what's some progress you believe you'd like to see everybody see yeah. us work towards? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to see you know within at least specifically the Muslim community. I think there's some education that we kind of have to do ourselves in terms of like understanding, getting back to like the sort of richness in that it is in Islamic art, and that doesn't mean you're making films about Muslims. It's just like we there's a beauty that you know like an imagination is is deeply intertwined in Islam, and so it's like how do we get to that space, and so I think we need to educate our community. So I look at myself in that moment when that guy told me, well, what is that film gonna do for our organization? I sort of was just like, well, dude, you don't get it. Let me just, I'm just gonna go show you, but like I sh probably should have been like, this is like what we need to be doing, right? Like we need mm -hmm. to be a part of this community in a way and express ourselves in a way and have, and, and, and the joy and the pain and everything that kind of comes with it, right? Um, and so from within there, it, it needs to be kind of okay for, a guy like Razi not to be an engineer, like from the beginning, you know, maybe that is beneficial for him in the long run to kind of have that, because now the guy has so much energy that's sort of pent up. You'll see him at every party, sort of like boom, boom, boom. Maybe he would have been that way if he hadn't done the engineering <laughs> track, right? So everything, you know, every dot you can kind of connect backwards, right? But 
But though there should be, like it should be reasonably like, okay, I wanna do this thing. There should be, you know, grants like ISF, bigger ones, and then, you know, for beginning career, mid-career, established career. And so it's not just per project, as you mentioned, but like as an artist, and it doesn't take much. You know what I mean? It, it goes along. As a journey. Yeah. It does, yeah, it just it doesn't take much, you know, when you're when you're first starting out, especially. You know, just a little bit of money goes a long way and that support and that feeling, you know, it, it, it really does a lot, man. Because, you know, the spectacle of the human spirit, I think, is something that we really need to get into in terms of like telling stories about. And, you know, Sundance and all the commercial stuff that kind of comes with filmmaking, like, let's also remember that like humans are spectacular people. And the Quran was revealed to <laughs> non-Muslims, it's for everyone, right? So there yeah. is no like, we got to remember what the stories are about people and people are dealing with complex things, you know? Yeah. And in our prep call, Kamal, you also said, I want to remind everybody that the nation, you know, like Muslims can build infrastructure, right? You cited. Yeah. So my parents were in the nation of Islam initially. And I remember my mom telling me stories about, you know, they have the paper Muhammad speaks and then, um, and the back of that, on the back of that paper there, she always told me there was always a hospital that they were gonna build. And I was, I remember just recently just being like kind of blown away. I was like, man, like where's the Muslim hospital at in this country? We have so many doctors, but like, where's the Muslim hospital? <laughs> and I was like, man, but the nation of Islam was actually going for that, right? And that they also were into um, elder care, right? Like where do like elder Muslims, like now it's kind of a big thing. Like they go into a facility where there's nothing that's even sort of remotely connected to them. Like, they never really achieved these dreams, but they was all, it was a part of like the goal. And I feel like we need to really kind of like, the immigrant and Muslim community kind of push African-Americans kind of a little bit to the side because maybe we don't have enough sort of power. We, it's, it's, you're looking towards who has power in society, right? And it's white people. So it's like, maybe there should have been a little more collaboration there, right? To, to sort of come together because, you know, black people could have brought a lot of cultural capital to the, to the, <laughs> to the conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, I just want to see more of that, right? Like, let's get, let's get busy. Let's make something. Yeah. Let's get an infrastructure. In our own way, right? So, in our own way. yeah. Well, before closing, I want each of you to, if you could think about this, five years from now, just name one thing you hope we accomplished through like these conversations. I would just, just one thing that you hope in five years we were able to achieve, right? But before that, you know, I wanna thank all of you for participating. Um, what I thought was beautiful in terms of how we talked about it was you all said you had met each other, but like through supporting each other's work, right? Like it wasn't transactional. It was like, you know, there's a, there's, like something that like somebody else in community was doing and there was something, you know, and then in one, what one, somebody said, I do this work because I don't want to feel alone, right? So I just want to really honor and celebrate the ethos that you all bring to this work. Um, it, you know, it's inspiring for us, you know, for Cam, we weren't sure that Doris Duke was going to be announcing the award. And, you know, for us, it was a little bit like, we, w we wanted to bear witness, and people have been saying congratulations. For us, this is a gift and a duty, and we, this is an opportunity for Cam to do something. You know, it's a privilege to make, to do something to make the world better. And I, you know, we are, it is, we understand the responsibility, and it is like such a gift and opportunity to be able to travel with you all and the other filmmakers in the audience, right? So it is, it, it, it's motivating and aspiring and it actually makes you want to do the work more. But I, but if you could, if we could circle back to, to, oh, oh no, oh shoot, I'm supposed to say, thank you to the Doris Duke Foundation <laughs> for all of your vision. Thank you to Sue and MPAC. And um, again, thank you all for being here tonight. But if we could close with what you'd like to see, what you hope we accomplish, what you can see in five years from now. Well, I, I think, and by the way, just really quickly, I should mention the, the, the gift uh, from Doris Duke to, to, to Cam doesn't come from nowhere. I mean, you guys have accomplished so much. And I think for those of you that don't know, you know, it's not just the, the grants, it's uh, artist fellowships, it's conferences, it's Cam Fest, which takes place in May. So if you're in the Bay Area, uh, I got to go to Cam Fest for the first time in, in, in my career 
last year, and it was a remarkable uh, experience. I highly, highly recommend it. So it didn't come out of nowhere. It's, it's building on the work that you guys are already doing. It's a moving train. Um, so really quickly, just to respond to what, what I see in the next five years is sustainability for uh, Muslim filmmakers, um, for, uh, for all of us to be thriving, succeeding, um, and excelling and really being at the top of the game in the film industry and in documentary and in, in television and scripted uh, The talent is there the talent is is there We know that and we just have to support Muslim filmmakers to be able to do that um, And I have goals for myself. I have goals for all of you. Um, I want to see this community thrive uh, And uh, of course, I want to see a free Palestine uh, to, to end the occupation to liberate uh, Palestine and and you know to decolonize the world I mean we've been suffering from this for far too long and this is the last settler colonial project and it's been just so so devastating and I think the knowledge and and the support is in the streets just governments need to come around governments are on the wrong side of history and I hope that my work and I hope that all of our work can come together to help make a change in this space and to uh, overturn the settler colonial project and free free Palestine so In five years, hmm, I would say that in this space that we're in right now, the Muslim house, the most important thing is for us to remember why we are here. And that our time here, what Palestine has taught us, is very temporary. It's very temporary. And how important it is for us to be rooted in compassion and love for one another. And what does that look like practically? That looks like, in my vision, that we are supporting one another with deep, deep connections to one another. And that we are collaborating on each other's projects. We are getting funding for each other's projects. We are in deep circles within each other's networks to be able to elevate one another. And, and with that, still remembering why we're doing what we're doing to help people remember that there is a much deeper calling for the work that we're doing to, to glorify our creator. I'm just gonna say it because we're in the Muslim house. I can say this. <laughs> yes, and that like, it is so important. Um, um, it is so important for us to remember what a gift we have to people, to have other people remember um, our, our duty for this catalyst, for a soul awakening, and that our work can do that. So in five years, having projects that are focused on spirituality and healing and doing that self-awareness work to get into the depths of our soul and finding platforms that will allow us to do that and creating our own platforms to do that. Um, and to have a network that is starting to compete, that is led by BIPOC folks um, with the Netflix and the Hulu and all of that, that is strong enough. I think it's possible in five years for us to do that. So, uh, yeah, yep. Thank you. And a free Palestine. <laughs> yes. And funding. And <laughs> Taban. Um, I want, I want us to have our time back. Uh, I want the the discussion we're having around what we build versus what we need to push back on. I want that to flip. I want most of our time mm -hmm. to be what we build. And when we sit across from somebody and try to have a connection or resource together, that that is predominantly about building rather than defending, uh, justifying uh, where the ask is coming from. Being attacked. Yeah. Uh, and I want to see global indigenous uprisings and a free Palestine. Okay. Uh, for me, I mean, I, I mean, I hope I'm still making films in five years. I think we all kind of hope. <laughs> can, can I keep stretching out? Keep doing this? Um, but I hope seriously in five years. I hope programs and, and institutions like ISF are giving out million dollar grants. You know, and like that's possible. I think we get the community support, and those grants are going to you know emerging artists, mid career artists, established artists. Um, that's what I hope to see, you know, and more institutions like ISF doing that. So, yeah. And then Fariha, I want to see her because she's a powerhouse. 
like in the C-suite doing green lighting projects. <laughs> yeah. Come with me. <laughs> Please. Well, Please thank you, all. everybody, for hanging with us. We really appreciate you spending time with us. And if we could thank the panel one last time.